morning, church. Let's all worship the Lord together. Father God, we come before you now, Jesus. God, would you be glorified? Would you be high and lifted up in this place, Jesus? We love you, God. We praise you. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my doom till I met you. I was breathing the night alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my doom till I Grab a seat. Good morning to see you guys. Go ahead and come on in and find a seat. Uh, so great. I uh, want to welcome you for those that are visiting. And uh, just good to have you in the seat pocket in front of you is an information card, a prayer request, and, and, um, and praise report card. Uh, if you want to fill that out, if you gave us your information, that'd be great. You're just going to get a card in the mail that thanks you for coming with a gift inside of it. And uh, that's pretty much it. Tish tells you a little bit more about the church. But on the back side of that card, if you'd fill out a praise report or a prayer request, that'd be great because we want to be praying with you or rejoicing with you in what God's doing in your life. And you can put those in our tithe boxes that are in the foyer. We don't pass a plate. 
here at Calvary Maricopa, but that's not to say that your giving is not important, but rather it's an act of worship between you and the Lord. And so we can go ahead and put those in the tithe boxes in the foyer. But uh, first off, I want to start off by saying, man, we had a great time here Friday night, the guys. We had 57 men in this room. Yeah. <laughs> we, had, <laughs> we had steak. We had shrimp. Right? We had asparagus on the grill. We had potatoes. We boiled and then smoked. They were just melt in your mouth. We, we, we had squash and zucchini and asparagus we did on this big open grill. It was man food. And I don't think there was hardly any left over. I mean, we just gorged ourselves. But there was a little bit of salad left, wasn't there, guys? There was some I don't know why. <laughs> there was some salad left. We didn't go through nearly as much salad as we thought. But, uh, you know, it was truly a man's event. It was a man's event. It was a great time. Also, we had some of the guys uh, bring out like a tool or a gadget that uh, we might have a hard time guessing what it might be used for. And we had the table, and, and, and uh, after eating, I got up, and we kind of went through and trying to guess, you know, which the guy's name had a tag with a name on it, trying to guess what it was. And, and by the time we got, what, when we got all done with it, I said, you know, guys, all these tools, all these gadgets, they represent you. As men, because only God knows what you're good for. <laughs> it was awesome. It was awesome, you know. But, uh, but super fun stuff. Um, just want to give a plug out. We have our men's retreat that we're start, where we've got the flyers like this in the back. And there's a sign-up sheet for that. Um, all the information, the schedule, everything is here on the back and the sign-up sheet. So just go ahead and get signed up. You pay here. want to make sure you uh, remind you to earmark your check. Uh, men's retreat. That way just doesn't go to general fund. Um, also, we have a newcomers fellowship. We do these every so often, um, and, and we're doing, having to do them more and more often because there's so many more new people coming, and, uh, and so um, it's just a great time. So Sunday, the 29th, Sunday the 29th, here at 4 o'clock, Come on out if you're, if you're fairly new to the church. It's a great time for us to get to know you. You get to know us. Ask some questions maybe that, that you might have about the church. Totally open. Um, we play an icebreaker. We've got some snacks. And uh, there'll be some other leadership here along with me and my wife. So just a really super time. So I want to invite you guys to come on out the 29th at 4 here at the church. Again, you can sign up for that in the back. Um, <clears throat> On the 4th of next month is our men's breakfast here at 8 o'clock. So I want to invite you guys to that. And also midweek, all the way through September, we're going to be doing Wednesday nights. We're presently going through the Beatitudes on Wednesday night. That's Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And, uh, and then our men's and women's Bible studies are still meeting through all, throughout September. So I want to encourage you guys to come on out, get plugged into something, even though those are kind of going to come to an end here in September. Um, I think we might end up uh, having some, some discipleship groups as far as men and women discipleship groups that will continue through the fall because some people are like, what? Bible study's ending? Or, man, I can't believe Wednesday nights are ending. You know, they don't want them to end. So we're going to come up with another midweek thing going on somehow. But um, we've got some fall stuff that we want to do. Some outreach, get out in the community, it's cooling off, the weather gets good, and so be looking for those opportunities to get out into the community. And I know my wife's got a ladies' dinner planned. You'll hear more about that. It'll be on the next, uh, next week we'll have the bulletin for the September out, so you'll be able to go through that. So um, lots of good stuff, um, but uh, let's go ahead and pray. And uh, oh yeah, I'm sorry. I, we have got a really cool video, children's ministry video. Go ahead, hit it. We need your help in children's ministry. Someone to hold babies. Get creative with the toddlers. Someone to teach kids like me. To welcome new families. To reach our community. Let's show God's love to all God's children. Pray, seek the Lord, serve, thank God. You in? <laughs> Isn't that awesome? What a great opportunity, right, to, to serve in our kids' ministry. And, and, you know, let's face it, you get to hold a baby and then give it back. And, and, and then teach a Bible lesson to an elementary school kid and then give the kid back. It's just a short time, right? It's wonderful. It's like, this is the kind of commitment. Because, I mean, I, I think uh, uh, Steve Jolette said they had their grandkids for like a month. And he's like, oh, he just took them home. 
He's like, oh my gosh, you know. But this is just serving the Lord for just a short period of time. So you can find out more. You can talk to Kim Baxter and get plugged in on what we're doing and how we're doing it back there and reaching our kids because it's important. We don't just babysit. We want to teach the kids about Jesus. We want to love on them. And your kids are very important to us. So um, I didn't pray yet, did I? I didn't pray to send to worship. No. Let's do that right now. Lord, thank you for the opportunity we have, Lord, to come into your presence this morning, Lord, to sit at your feet, to come together with like-minded brothers and sisters in Christ, to be encouraged, built up, challenged as we sit at your feet, as we look at your holy word this morning. Lord, we pray that you would be magnified. And Lord, this morning, we also want to lift up the persecuted church. We lift up those Christians and missionaries in Afghanistan, Nigeria, Africa, China, and all over the world that are being persecuted today, this morning, martyred, killed for their faith in you. We pray for those that, that aren't of faith, that are suffering. We pray, Lord, that the gospel would go out with boldness and it wouldn't be silenced. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand and worship.
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, a name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. We live for you. alone cornerstone we 
weak made strong in the Savior's love through the song for you yeah. to worship the Lord in this song God was speaking to me and he said you know Trev I think that uh, all the trials and all the, the, the crazy things that are going on in your life one of those one of these days I'm going to come back and all of those things are going to be gone there will be no more cancer, no more pain, no more sickness, car accidents. There will be no more hatred. One day Jesus will come back and rule all. And we'll be there with him. And even though now for a moment we have to experience those things, we're looking forward to a day. A day where God comes and he makes all things new. And I just said hallelujah and amen.
God, we cry hallelujah and amen, God. Praise be to God and so be it. Lord, we look forward to that day, God. We look forward to the day, God, where we're no longer in these sin-riddled bodies, God, where we're no longer beholden to this world and its confines, God, where our faith, God, will become our sight, Jesus. And we'll see you, God, and we'll be with you, God, and all those who have gone before us, God. Lord, give us eyes to see, God, ears to hear, hands to be doing, God, and feet to go. While we're here, Jesus, there's still work to be done, God. We're not called home just yet. But we look forward to that day, God. And right now, Jesus, as your word goes out, God, as Pastor Roger comes and he opens the scriptures, Father God, will we see them for what they are, God. They're vital. They're good. So necessary for our lives, God. And I know no mere man or woman knows how to make any other person fall in love with the scriptures. But you do, God. Your spirit does, God. Your spirit can come and open up our eyes, God, and remove the scales, Lord, to see into the truth that is there, Jesus. Let us love your word, God. more than food and water that feed us. Jesus, we love you. We praise you, God. Amen. Amen. All our junior high and high schoolers are making their way out to their room. What a blessing. Ken, we'll be praying for you. Isn't that awesome? Look at all those kids. Sanctuary just half emptied. What the heck? That is so great. If there wasn't young people here, we would have no reason to be here. Right? That's a testament to what God's doing. God's moving. Well, this morning, if you've got your Bible, hopefully you do, you can open that to Revelation 22. If you don't have your Bible, you can raise your hand, and an usher would love to put one in your hand so that you can follow along. Very important, because it, uh, it's as if, you know, part of learning is seeing and seeing what's written down. Very good stuff. The title of the message this morning is, Behold, I'm Coming Soon, or, or Quickly, in our passage. Jesus is coming quickly. That's the very root, common part of the text if you would. So, I want to start by posing a question. Which should you and I be most afraid of or fear the most? Apathy or the Taliban? First service was pretty quick. They got it. Apathy. They all said it like that. First service, apathy. Apathy. You know, I think... It's good that we don't have persecution necessarily. I mean, we might go, yay, you know, we're not being persecuted. You know, the Taliban's not here. But, but I think the enemy is working overtime keeping that persecution to some degree away because he knows that apathy is more dangerous than an enemy with a sword. Really is. Really is. We just slowly walk away cold and think we're okay, right? We can tolerate all kinds of sin, all kinds of stuff going on in our nation, and it translates, it filters into our lives. If we're not careful, if we're not on guard, we've got to be careful. The passage this morning, there's still a big warning here even at the end of the book. We want to pick up on the warning. There's, an, there's, a, there's a verification in the passage. There's an invitation in the passage. And there's a warning in the passage. And here we are at the very last chapter of the Word of God. And it's still consistent, you'll see, just not through the Gospels, but through the Old Testament from Genesis to Revelation. 
God is revealing himself through his word. He's making himself known. And this is who I am. And if I am who I say I am, then behold, I am coming quickly. God's final words describe with certainty that Jesus is returning. And one can expect a true and living creator and savior to return. I mean, this very statement sets Christianity apart from all other forms of religion. No other God is returning. There might be a promise of some future life, but no return is possible because all other gods are dead. They're not living. Jesus rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And from that very point, he says, I'm coming back. Right before he went up, he said, I'm coming back. And we can bank on that promise. That's a big part of our faith, our doctrine as children of God, as Christians, believers in Jesus. Part of our doctrine is that he's returning. And we're going to look at that doctrine this morning. In verse 6, as we'll read, the angel verifies these words are faithful, or better translated, trustworthy and true, confirming both the truth and accuracy, as well as the possibility or the ability to comprehend the words of this prophecy, of this revelation. It's, it's knowable. You can know it. The purpose of the revelations here in the book of Revelation reveal the prophetic book. And it's meant to communicate, as it says in verse 6, the bottom half, to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. His servants. Many dismiss the view that we can understand the book of Revelation or even understand prophecy. They say that we don't have the keys to presently unlock these truths. They're unknowables. That's a farce. Prophecy is given that we might understand that God would reveal himself to us through the prophecies as they're being fulfilled. That's what makes a prophecy something prophetic. He spoke it and then he fulfills it. The very nature of the Bible is God revealing himself. And as we have learned in our study through this amazing book, the book of Revelation, God is revealing himself even to the end of the book. And even more so, in this very last chapter, he's pulling out all stops. He's revealing himself. He's making himself known to those that have an ear to hear. Let's go ahead and read our passage, Revelation 22, picking up in verse 6. And then he said to me, these words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Now I, John, I saw and I heard these things. And when I heard and I saw, I fell down to worship before the feet of an angel who showed me these things. And then he said to me, See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant and your brethren, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book. God, verse 10. And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, well, let him be unjust still. And he who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and end, the first and the last. We're going to stop right there for this morning. With uncertainty, the angel speaks. Again, this is the angel that has been speaking here in 22, the tail end of 21. 
This is one defined as one of the angels who had one of the seven seals of the seven final bowl judgments. A holy angel from the presence of God is revealing these things and saying these things to John. Now here in this last chapter, it can be a little bit confusing of who's speaking. One minute, the angel's speaking, then John, Jesus is speaking, then the angel speaks, then Jesus speaks. But there's a theme here within this last chapter. There's a verification of the truth of the prophecies. There's an invitation within the prophecy, and there's a warning within the prophecy for the church. Let's start with the verification of these prophecies revealed. He verifies these words are faithful. They're, they're truth worthy. They're true. The angel here shows John and reminds us that the word is indeed trustworthy. If the Bible is not the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God, you need to get there. Because the prophecies and the promises and even the warnings will mean nothing to you. They'll have no effect if the Bible is not supernatural, that it's not the word of God. And it says, the angel then continues and says, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel, speaking of himself, to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Here's this certainty of urgency, even in the book. This is what we're supposed to gather up. There's an urgency to this message. Again, this, state, takes, this statement takes us back to the previous statement that the words are trustworthy. And by confirming that the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. God is revealing himself to his servants. We are clearly reminded that scripture or the word of God supports scripture. Prophecy supports prophecy. What was spoken by the holy prophets is still true today. Nothing's canceled anything out. And still, at the end of the book, the Ancient of Days is still speaking. And he's speaking to who? To his servants. The Greek word there is doulos. Many of you might know that. It means literally a slave, the slave of God, the, the bondservant of God. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew 24, 42. You should know that Matthew 24 is a prophetic chapter of the last days in the gospel. Most of Matthew, in fact, all of Matthew 24 in your Bible, the words are red lettered. Jesus is speaking. Jesus is teaching. Jesus is preaching. Jesus is warning about the last days. And if we look at 24, 42 through 46, I want you to look at what he says. He starts off in 42, watch. I want you to watch. Therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming, your master is coming. But know this. Now, there, there's, there's a part of this you don't know. You, you don't know when your master is coming, but this you should know in verse 43. Know this, that if the master or the Lord of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. He, he, remember, he started up, watch. Now, if you knew what time he was going to come, you would have been watching and not allowed his house to be broken into. His house. As a servant, you're guarding his house. 44, therefore, you also be ready. Watch and be ready for the Son of Man. Who's coming back? Jesus Christ is coming at an hour you do not expect. 45, so when it, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, who then, 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant, doulos, whom his master or Lord made ruler over his house to give them food in due season, 46. And here's a beatitude. Right in the middle of this end time prophetic passage and chapter, here's a beatitude. Blessed is that servant, that doulos, 
whom his master or Lord, when he comes, will find so doing. There it is. There's your beatitude. Right here in 24. Blessed. It means fortunate, happy, encouraged, excited, overflowing is a servant who's prepared for the Lord's return. Back to Revelation chapter 22. So in verse 7, here's the passage. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Behold, Jesus himself now speaks. This is not the angel speaking. Jesus is saying, behold, I'm coming quickly. With a profound prophetic promise, I'm coming soon. The word behold here is a bidding to the reader or a bidding to the hearer to listen to what is saying. Jesus would use terminology or words like assuredly, assuredly, I say unto you. Or behold, like pay attention. Listen, take heed to what I'm saying. Behold, these are important words. The master's speaking, the Lord is speaking. And the word quickly can also be translated soon. The Greek word literally means to come speedily or without delay. Well, then the question has to be posed. Without delay, it seems like he's been delaying a long time. And we know, I guess we, we try to understand that God lives outside of time and space and, and he's not subject to time. He doesn't have a wristwatch like you and I or a cell phone with a clock on it and a timer and alarm to get up and go to work. He doesn't operate like that. But even so, we have to consider the question, why has he waited so long when he promised that I'm coming back speedily? I'm coming back soon. Listen, all throughout the word of God, God wants to keep all generations, this is what's important, to keep all generations expectant. Just like it says in Matthew 24, to keep all generations watching, ready for his return. Remember, he also said that he was coming in an hour when we at least expected, and he was coming like a thief in the night. But I want to give you three better reasons why he's tarried and how our attitude should be regarding this, this him not coming back. But when he does, he's coming back quickly. First, I believe strongly that this is a reference to the rapture of the church when he comes back for his bride. In Revelation, it was chapter 4. Chapter 4 was the last time we saw the church, the bride of Christ, in the book of Revelation. The rapture had taken place all through the book. We don't see the bride of Christ till the bride comes back with Jesus at the end of the seven-year tribulation period with the martyred saints to rule and reign with him for a thousand years prior to heaven coming down. A new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem coming down. Very simple, not hard to get, not hard to understand. I believe that's a reference. He's coming quickly, the rapture's gonna happen. At a time when you least expect it, he's gonna come for his church, for his bride, for those that are children of God. Secondly, if Jesus is coming back for those that are his in the near future, and no one knows the day of the hour, how does that shape the church? How does that shape the bride? How does the bride of the church conduct itself if we don't know when he's going to come back? Better yet, how does that adjust the way each of us should live our lives as Christians? If we knew Jesus was returning, let's just say we knew he was returning August 22nd, 2023, exactly two years from today. Now, I'm not prophesying that. I'm just theoretically saying, if we today, we knew that Jesus was going to come back in two years from today, now that's plenty of time for us to get our act together, right? If we knew that he was coming back. If we knew he was coming back, how would that affect your life? In two years, you got two years. How would that affect your life? What changes would you make if he was coming back in two years? What would your Christianity look like? Would you sin less? Would you love more? 
What changes would you make? Would you read your Bible differently or read it more? Would you be more eager to share your faith with others? Would you take church a little more serious and get a little more, more out of it? In fact, maybe put a little bit more into it. The questions can go on and on. But see, that's the whole purpose. And the fact that he could come back at any time. It adjusts the way we live. It's a very important doctrine to the Christian faith. In fact, the first century church believed that Jesus could come back. The apostles taught them he could come back tomorrow. This is super important because it changes the way that I live my life for Christ. I talked about apathy in the beginning, and, it, and it's dangerous. Now, I don't know about you, but there was a time in my life when, I mean, I was super comfortable before I was a Christian. Super comfortable. I started riding motorcycles when I was five years old. I started racing when I was eight. By the time I was 12, I was traveling all over the United States, and I turned pro when I was 16. Listen, I was on a racetrack or on a motorcycle anywhere from one to three times a week. Okay? It was my life. It was, I was engulfed. And, and that was my place. You can ask my wife. She, when we were teenagers, I mean, Denise and I have been hanging out since we were 12, 13 years old. You know, and, 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 and I was one way at school and com some completely different at the racetrack. I mean, I was uncomfortable at school. I didn't like school, right? I just stayed to myself. I was like a little wall. I just, sta just, just stayed in the, in the back in the, in the shadows, just real quiet. But you got me in my environment. And, and that was like church. It was like church. It was like I was comfortable. I was the real self there. I was really me. I was in my zone. I was just, I was truly Roger. Now, I don't know if there was a time in your life where maybe it was a bar, you know, like Cheers. Remember the old TV show Cheers? You know, everybody was welcome, and maybe you went two, three times a week, and that was your church, man. You knew everybody there. Everybody knew you by name. And, and really, to be honest, you were your real self. There was there's a hobby you were involved in or a time, maybe a season in your life where you were just you were comfortable in that environment. For me, it's here. It's here, almost more than anywhere else. I've been a Christian for almost 33 years, and I love being here. I, I, I am, I'm comfortable here. It's no longer that. This is, this is me. I love being here. I love sharing my life with you. I'm here. This is, this is just what I do. I, I'm in my, this is my zone. I'm like, not like I'm all spiritual. I just, I'm comfortable because I love God. And I love you, and I love being here. This is, for me, this is life, whether I was the pastor or not. This is it for me. This is where I come. And it's the cure for that apathy. And it's the answer for that courage that I need to stand against the enemy, to keep the right spiritual frame of mind, to walk in love, to walk in service, to walk in humility, to walk in his word, walking in the spirit. I can't accomplish that outside of this place. Not a chance. God's working in my life through this place. And if it wasn't this place, it'd be another place. God would lead me someplace else. God's got a place where he wants to do that work in your life. He's preparing you for his return. And you should be comfortable in church. I'm going to say something really mean. Are you ready? I'm going to say it in love. We're real loving boys. Picture me giving you a hug when I say this. If you go to church, this one or any other church, and you're not comfortable, chances are you're the problem, not the church. Because you're not comfortable with Jesus. You're not comfortable with the truth. You're not comfortable with eternity and the fact that Jesus is coming back for you and it could be today. You're not comfortable. Man, I'm, he's coming back. And I love it. And he's coming back for you, Mario. And I'm pumped to be here. I'm here because he's coming back tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, the next day. Get comfortable with that. Get comfortable with eternity. I said last week, you can know that you, are, you have eternity ahead of you. you can, the Bible tells us. I covered those verses last week. Go back and watch the message. You can know that you're saved and you're going to be with heaven in heaven in eternity with God. And with, and with 
Gene. Because I know Gene's going. He's leading the way. Awesome. Amen? Thirdly, we know we're living in the last days. We know Jesus is coming back. And I want you to listen. First, the fall of righteousness, morality, and truth is at an all-time high. Jesus is coming back quickly. Secondly, the weak leadership around the world in the midst of evil and murder is at an all-time high. Jesus is coming back quickly. And the rapid turning from God, as well as a rapid turning to God, reveals that Jesus is coming back, and he's coming back quickly. The fact that the doctrine that, that he's returning at any moment is a doctrine that divides the sheep and the goats, and, and we're going to see that in the passage as we draw a little bit towards the end. Those that are vile and evil and unrighteous, unjust, they'll continue still. And those that are righteous will continue still. I'll talk more about that in just a second. But he says, behold, I'm coming quickly. Or soon. Both are accurate. Jesus said on one hand, I'm coming quickly. Which says that his return is going to happen suddenly or speedily. Like the rapture, in a twinkling of an eye, in a moment, unexpected, at a time when you don't know. But on the other, on another hand, he's coming soon, which says the child of God throughout every generation has a foreview of this event in your mind and in your heart. It's something you've added to your living. It's something you've added to the walking out of your faith every day. Is the foreview of Jesus coming back for you. It's important, very important. Therefore, here's the first of the warnings. Blessed, well, there's a beatitude right in the middle of the passage, just like in Matthew 5. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. This is the same Greek word used in Matthew 5. It literally means this person Blessed is supremely blessed or supremely fortunate, like happy, like on a level, like winning the lottery doesn't even get you, right? So happy, fortunate is the person who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Keeping the words, holding fast, as it said in Matthew 24, I just said, watching. Holding fast is watching. Keeping your eye on the prize. Are we keeping these words? Because these words will keep you. Are we keeping the prophecies in this book? Because the prophecies in this book will keep you. That's what it's saying. Now, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's beatitudes in the Bible other than just Matthew 5. There are seven beatitudes in the book of Revelation. I want to give them to you real quickly. The first one, the very first beatitude, write it down, Revelation 1.3. He says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Chapter 1, he's saying the same thing he's saying in the very last chapter, in 22. If we had time, we could go back to the Old Testament and come all the way back through. The Bible's saying the same thing. Keep it. Keep the faith. Hold fast to the prophecies of this book. And the whole thing's prophetic. Every word in it. Hold fast. Keep the things that are in this book. The very first one for the time is near. That's your first beatitude. The second is Revelation 14, 13. And then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write. Now, this was something, right? John's all through the book. He's reminded, look, 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 write this down. Poor John. He's just like, write it down. I don't even know what I'm looking at. Can you imagine being John? Write it down, write it down, write it down. So he's told, write these things down. Blessed 
are the dead who die in the Lord from, <clears throat> from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Oh, happy is the person, blessed is the person that has this promise. And this promise comes from holding fast to the prophecies of the word. Do, do you have that promise? Look, that beatitude. Number two. Number three. The third beatitude, Revelation 16, 15. Behold, he says, I'm coming as a thief. Just like he said in Matthew. Kind of consistent, right? All the way through. Blessed is he who watches. Just like Matthew 24. Just like it. Blessed he who watches and keeps his garments. Look, look. We're all born sinners. Our garments are soiled, spiritually speaking, and only Jesus washes you white as snow. So here's the prophetic thing. Don't go soiling up your garment, fool. <laughs> Jesus made you white as snow. Don't go play in the mud. You remember when, our son, one Sunday morning, we're all ready for church. He's like six. We're we just moved to Alabama. We're living, we got these neighbors. And this old guy, I mean, he was, I don't know how old this old Fred was. You guys, Fred. And, and one morning, Ty was all ready for church. And he goes, Dad, 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 can I go out and play? I said, dude, go, but don't get dirty. Just don't get dirty. So I'm getting Lauren all ready, Denise and I. And we hear, I hear this, pop, pop, pop. I'm like, what the heck? Like a gun went off. So I come walking out there, getting Lauren in the car and starting the car. And here comes my neighbor Fred, this guy, and he's got a dead squirrel. Well, he's got my son who's holding the dead squirrel in his church clothes. Squirrel blood is running all down his hand. He goes, Dad, look what Fred shot. <laughs> You're in church clothes, dude. Like now, I can't. we were late to church. He soiled his garments, right? Don't be soiling your garment. Because listen, lest you walk naked and the world just shakes their head in shame. Look at that fool. What a hypocrite. God washed him white as snow and he's out there soiling his garments up. Blessed are those, right, who watch and keep their garments clean. That's that one. Okay, moving on down through here. The fifth, Revelation 20, verse 6. Oh no, sorry, fourth. Gosh, I'm going slow. Let's speed up. Revelation 19, 9. And then he said to me, write, okay, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are true sayings of God. The marriage supper of the Lamb. This was right after, right? Right after the end of the tribulation period, you have the martyred saints and you have the, the, the raptured church come back with him, and the first thing that takes place before the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Blessed. Blessed. What a blessed. What a joyful thing to look forward to is what he's saying. How powerful is that? The fifth, Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Blessed, happy is the person who the first death has no power over you. I'm saved. He conquered sin and death. And therefore, I'm a child of God and I'm going to come back. And he's speaking to the thousand year millennial reign of Christ. We will rule and reign with him right after the marriage supper of the Lamb. Pretty simple. How powerful are these Beatitudes? Six is in our passage. Let me touch on the seventh. Well, the sixth is Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Seven, the seventh, Revelation 22, 14. And we'll get to more of it next week. But it says, blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the, um, the right to the tree of life. Remember, last week, Right, We have a river coming from the throne of God with the tree of life, whether it's one giant tree engulfed in the river or it's multiple trees of life. The commentators are like this. Okay, But the tree of life is there, and we partake of it. And this beatitude uh, um, even uh, identifies that. 
But more than that, we have a right to the tree of life that we may enter through the gates of the holy city freely. Free access. Blessed. Listen, these blessings remind us that prophecy gives us something to keep. Something to keep. Something to live out. More than just something to argue about. I mean, and, and when we get to the talking about arguing about the Bible, I mean, this stuff, we still want to argue about this all day long. I've got some friends that just want to sit down there and just like argue all this. It's like, are you kidding me? I want to live it out. And let's just say, let's just say, I clearly understand 80% of the book of Revelation through previous prophecies and my knowledge of the word of God. Then I have a responsibility to live out the 80% I know. And listen, I'm not worried about the 20%. I could care less. God will reveal that to me in my time. But you and I, we need to live out what I do know, what he's revealed to me, live it out. Obey the commandments of God. And you know, I think that if we were to obey more of the prophecies, we'd understand more prophecies. Don't you think? Pretty simple stuff, pretty simple math. Verses eight and nine. Now I, John, he said, I saw and I heard these things. And when I heard and I saw... He makes the mistake of falling down again, just like he did in chapter 19, verse 10. He falls down and he worships this angel. Now, I want to have a little bit of grace on John because he's having all this experience, right? And he just gets all caught up. I mean, this is holy stuff. Like, this is stuff right from the throne room of God. And he just, you know, he just drops down. You know, I know, I mean, you know, the angel says, get up, like he's clearly uh, attributing some of this to this angel, but for crying out loud, this is a holy angel that's coming from God, that's speaking forth the words of God. I mean, easy to make the mistake, right? In fact, how many people get caught up in worshiping a pastor or a church leader or a well, self-proclaimed prophet? You know, but let's say he's prophesying and all this stuff is coming true. Man, we, we lift, oh, you know, and we just fall down, we worship the fool. We get, we make the same mistake. But the angel says, get up, what are you doing? Get up. See that you do not do that. For I am your fellow servant. I'm your fellow doulos. We share the same master, bro. We're on the same team. Get, get up, fool. Don't do that. Don't worship me. We have the same brother in the prophets. And of those who keep the words of this book, worship God. Here again, here's the exhortation. Keep the words of the book. I'm coming quickly. This is the current message coming down. John, have a little bit of grace on him. But we gotta get caught up in, in who we're worshiping sometimes. Because listen, no created thing should ever be worshiped. Even back in the Old Testament, in Exodus 34, 14, it says, For you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Some of you ladies did a study on the names of God. Raise your hand. You did some. Did you study that name? Because it didn't. No, that's okay. Most of us leave that out. It says his name is Jealous. That's just, again, that's one of his names. In your scripture, rightly so, it's capitalized when it says, just like it is on the screen, whose name is Jealous, for small j, for he is this jealous God. Deuteronomy 4, 24 says, for the Lord God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now, I don't know about you, but I understand jealousy through love. Jealousy, well, healthy jealousy, manifests itself through love. (laughs) I love my wife. And God gave me these. I'm a jealous dude. Don't mess with my old lady. She's mine. God gave her to me. And we're going to use, I'm going to use these right here. God gave me these too. Right? I'm a, uh, yeah, I love her. And listen, God loves you too. God's jealous for you. He's went to great lengths for you. And reading the Bible tells us that. He will fight for you. He is jealous for you. He wants your undivided worship, not the worship of anything or anybody else. He is jealous because he is the manifestation of absolute perfect love. Perfect love. And how could perfect love not be jealous for something that truly belongs to him? You're mine. 
I've bought you with a price. He won't put up with somebody coming in, stepping in on his bride. He won't put up with it. And we shouldn't either because we have a relationship with God. Right? Let's keep that in mind. Add to that that Jesus had no issues receiving worship on several occasions. Now, I want to share with you one of my favorite, my favorites, right? The disciples, they're in a boat. But this time, Jesus ain't in a boat with them, right? He said, I'll go to the other side. I'll meet you on the other side. So they're in the boat, and, of course, a storm comes up, and these super awesome, amazing fishermen are freaking out for their life, right? And as the storm's going on, at least one of them knows, there's a ghost on the water. Oh, and then all of a sudden, it must have been Peter, that said, wait, that's, that's the Lord, He's walking on the water. And so it says that Peter got to the bow of the boat and he stepped out of the boat onto the waves. Are you kidding me? It didn't look like that. We're talking about a storm and waves that were causing these guys to fear for their lives. Peter fell out of the boat. He was trying to get out of the boat, but it wasn't like all like, oh, and he just stepped out of the boat, all like super spiritual. And he's like now surfing on the waves. Are you kidding me? He's like, he's like bouncing around. And he just like flips out of the boat. He lands on the water. He's looking at Jesus, right? He's walking on water. He's standing on the water. This is what really took place. But Peter quickly took his eyes off of Jesus and he fixed them on the storm, didn't he? And he began to sink. And at that moment, Jesus stretches out his hand and he pulls Peter back up to the top of the waves. And he says to him, <laughs> perfect time for a rebuke, Right? Jesus, why can't you just say, give me a hug and tell me you love me? That's what I need right now. No, he says, Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Right there in the middle of the storm, he gets rebuked. Why you doubt? And then the very next verse is Matthew 14, And then those who were in the boat came and worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Worship. Worship. I love that. They worshiped Jesus as God. Listen, if it was clearly wrong for John to bow and worship this holy angel in whom Jesus is speaking through, then it's wrong for us to worship any man or any woman, regardless of how spiritual or holy they may seem. Remember, at the halfway point of the tribulation, as we learned, the Antichrist will rise up and demand to be worshipped and worshipped as God. Be careful who you worship in these last days because the real Lord is coming back. He's coming back. And then he says, so don't do that. Stop doing it. For I am your fellow servant and your brethren, right? I'm your fellow doulos. 10 and 11, here's the warning. And he said to me, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, though, let him be righteous still. And he who is holy, let him be holy still. Now, if we go back to Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, Daniel was told to seal up the prophecies of the book because the prophecies were deep into the future. But now God is revealing himself in the church age as this is pinned. Remember, this book went out just towards the tail end of the first century to the Christians. Right on the heels of great martyrdom from, the, from Rome, from Nero. It's important to understand kind of the thing here. He says, so don't seal up the book. We should keep the prophecy of this book open, not hidden. And look, and this is just the way we live. Again, it's, it's a big exhortation. The whole thing's prophetic. And maybe you don't understand everything, but you've got to share what you know. Don't seal it up. Don't lock it up. And that's the big mistake that Bible scholars, they won't even try to teach the book of Revelation. Look, I'll be honest with you, I, I, every time I go through it, I, get, I get understand a little better, I get through it a little better, I do a better job presenting it to you. I don't claim to be like super like, oh, I know everything about everything. But the more I read it, 
And the more I pray and the more I study it, the more clear it gets. And then I've got the responsibility to share that. Now, whether I'm talking about the Old Testament and who God is there in the Old Testament, or I'm talking about the gospel and what you know about the gospel of John, or we're talking about the book of Revelation, it's not to be hidden. It's open. God today is revealing himself and making himself known because he's coming back quickly. I'm coming back. Don't seal up because the time is at hand. Now, the time is at hand. Here we are in the last days. Jesus could come back tomorrow. Therefore, he says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. Right? He who is filthy or vile, let him be filthy or vile, depending on your translation, still. It's a separating of those sheep and of those goats, so to speak, of those in the faith and those outside of the faith. What we clearly see here is an exhortation. Listen closely. That in the last days, those who do evil and are unjust will remain so. Just like those who are righteous and holy will remain so. The time of the Lord's return is near, and in many ways, we shouldn't expect too many big changes. The idea here, this verse, reveals the fact that evil will continue to grow evil. Those that are vile and unholy and unjust will continue to grow unholy and vile and unjust. And those that are righteous and holy will completely continue to be completely set apart for the work of Christ. Now, don't make a mistake. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna bring up the big C word here, the, 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 the Calvinist doctrine, okay? This is, this is clearly speaking out against that whole thing because he says, don't seal up. You gotta make it known, make it known to everybody, regardless. And we leave this in the hands of God. The idea is there is wickedness in the heart of mankind that will not turn to God. And their sin and their unjust, their wickedness will continue to grow. And we're seeing that in the world today. And yet, the gospel's still going out. And yet people are still being saved. He's still calling the righteous. People still have an ear to hear. Right? If not, he would say, seal it up. I'm done. I've already chosen who's going and who's not going. Seal it up. I've already made my decision. He hasn't made this. It's not clear. The gospel's out. The invitation is still open. It's important. Important. I got a quote here. Wolverd said this regarding that passage. If the warnings of this book are not sufficient, there is no more that God has to say. If you get through the end of this book, and you still don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. The Lord just kind of goes, hey, I told you. I've done it all. I've gone as far as I can go. You're either going to believe or you're not going to believe. The unjust will continue to go unjust and the righteous will, get, will be righteous. The unjust and the righteous. I, 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 it's all been said. If you've got to the end of the book and you, and you still are having problems, he, 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 go back to the beginning and read it again. Go back to the beginning and read it again. I had a, a person come up to me at the end of the first service and they said, I loved your message. I only had one problem with it. You said that Jesus was God. Yes. And I said, yes, I did. No, he calls himself the son of God. I, I, don't, I don't get into arguments or conversations like that at church. You want to call me or text or email me, you can do that on Tuesday. We'll talk about it. I'd love to walk you through it. But I am not going to change or stop teaching. So you are welcome to come every Sunday and sit and listen and to grow in your faith. I said, but don't expect me to teach anything different. The warnings of this book should be changing the life of the believer and adjusting our doctrine and our thinking in these last days. 12 and 13, here in closing, again, he declares, I'm coming quickly. And behold, I'm coming quickly. And, but he goes, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. This is important. Again, there's a, a note of urgency and warning here within the message, just like it was in Matthew 24. And he says, my reward is with me. My reward 
He holds the rewards. This word reward here, it's better translated wages or what's due. Listen, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back with your check. He's coming back to pay wages. And the things that we've done in Christ are the only things that we'll get rewards for. Therefore, it's super important to check ourselves and make sure the service we do, we do with a right heart before God. It has to be. Because what's not done with a pure heart will just get burnt up. You won't get any jewels in your crowns for those things. There's no payment. There's no reward. He's coming back. He's coming back quickly. He's coming back soon. And he's bringing, and he's bringing his wages. He, what's due to us that's coming from him. Now this word rewards, it speaks both of a reward in the positive as well as the negative in the original Greek. It could speak of punishment as well. Now remember here, though, we're not saved by works, but our works, they're like fruit on a tree that says, I know what kind of tree you are. If you belong to God, you bear fruits worthy of God that represent God. Pretty simple. I want to read a couple scriptures to you. Romans 4, 4. It says, now to him who works, the wages, same Greek word for reward, are not counted as grace, but debt. And so here, the whole idea is work is put in the negative in light of grace. Now, you got to understand, grace, understanding God's grace, is the motive through what we do for God. Therefore, it's really not works. I'm operating in grace. It's an extension of the grace of God as you serve others, as you serve the Lord. It's an extension of grace. So to be critical, to be judgmental, to be about yourself is the opposite of grace. Grace, the acronym, is God's riches at Christ's expense. So I've got to be adjusted. John 4, 36 and he who reaps receives wages, same Greek word as reward, and gathers fruit for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. I'm into reaping wages through God's grace. Not at my own expense or at your expense or not through my strength. I have none. 2 John 1.8 Look to yourselves that you do not lose those things, which, uh, things we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Be careful. Check yourself. The things that you're working for, you don't want to lose those things, right? You want them to be lasting. You want to receive a full reward for what God is, what you're doing in Christ, whether it's service or whether it's giving or whether it's, it's your love for others. We're called love others. I mean, it's an other-centered gospel, right? And let's be honest. Sometimes we just got to just like, I, I'm really struggling. I don't like that person, much less love them. And it might be your spouse. But you got to get to a place where you're loving that person through God's love. Because if you're loving them in your own strength, if you're trying to muster up your own love, you're, there's no reward for that. This is what he's saying. Here's a quote. It is the quality of a man's life which provides the ultimate indication of what he really believes. It is the quality of a man's life which provides the ultimate indication of what he really believes. You, what you really believe is seen in your service and your quote-unquote work for God. What you really believe is made manifest in how you operate and how you, how you uh, conduct yourself with other people. And, and look, nobody's perfect. But if you are walking in grace, 
You're an extension of that grace. Finally, he says, now I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. An indication here of who God really is. As an added incentive for us to do and to be what is right and being ready for Jesus' return reminds us just who he is. If we really know him, if we really learn, if we press in and we want to know who God is, we should have no problem understanding that he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The Alpha and the Omega, uh, the alpha and omega is, the, uh, is, again, the, uh, the first and the last letters in the Greek alphabet. And it's, it's a way of God saying, I'm, the, I'm everything. Everything in between, I'm summed up. I, I am, I'm everything here. This phrase, though, in the book of Revelation, I am the Alpha and the Omega, Alpha and Omega, is spoken of three times. So listen closely. In chapter 1 8, it's applied to God the Father. In Revelation 21 6, it's applied to God the Father. But it's here in 22 that it's applied to Jesus Christ, which is a crowning proof of his deity, that he is God. Look, this is the deal. He's coming back. He's coming back soon. He's coming back quickly. And and it adjusts the way in which I live, the way I serve, the way that that I, 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 I communicate. I live out my life before God. It adjusts everything. And so if I remove this doctrine from my life, my Christianity, then I'm not prepared to meet Christ. And he wants you and I to be prepared. He wants his church. He's coming back for a church without spot or blemish, one that's prepared and ready to meet him in the air right now. And I guess it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It doesn't matter. Because my heart needs to be adjusted on a daily basis. And this doctrine, if we hold this before our eyes, it will do just that. Especially in light of when the world's getting more and more wicked, I I, I keep a perspective. I stay grounded. I don't get carried away with a bunch of false junk. Boy, I'm telling you, listen, the enemy wants, and I've gone through the whole thing, all through the book of Revelation, the enemy is a deceiver and he wants to deceive you. He wants you to get your eyes off of Jesus and the fact that he could come back tomorrow. So be careful when you're listening to the news and be careful what you're reading. If it's pulling you away from that, don't, don't read it. Don't take it in. Don't take it in. And, and, and look, it's super important. It's super important to how you love people and how you serve and how you proclaim Christ. Go tell someone. Just tell them, man, Jesus loves you and he can come back tomorrow, dude. He's got a plan for your life. Man, the gospel's simple. Sam here, if you, you, I don't know if you get your hair cut by Sam, but you should, or his brother, but Sam's even better. I'm just joking. <laughs> you can't sit in this dude's chair without hearing the gospel. It, it, it's impossible. He probably preaches about 50 messages a day because I go get my hair cut and I hear a message. That's where I get my sermons. No. (laughs) Listen, we need to be about the Father's business. It's super high priority, right? He's coming back. Don't get distracted. Worship team, come on forward. This morning, if you need prayer for any reason whatsoever, if you want to know more about a personal relationship with Jesus, if you haven't, if you, if, you, you, if you don't know, if you don't know that you're going to heaven, if you don't know that eternity is sealed, that you are his, man, just, all you've got to do is come up and we want to pray with you. Because if you come up, it means you're already convicted That means God's working in your life. And we just simply want to pray with you. Man, if you want prayer for any reason, don't leave here without being prayed for. Don't do it. Come up and get prayed for. We want to pray for you. It's it's just, we just, it's extended ministry. Church ain't done until everybody's been prayed for.
that needs to be prayed for. Father, thank you for your word this morning. Man, we love you, Lord. God, help us to keep our eyes on the prize. We don't need to be getting distracted. We need to be just in love with you, God. Give us clarity. Give us understanding. Give us wisdom and discernment here in these days. Your word says you're the chief cornerstone. Lord, help us to be grounded, founded, firm on that chief cornerstone, you, Jesus. It's all about you and you've, what you've done. You are mighty to save. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Struck one.
God is good. God is good. I want you guys, uh, I want to encourage you guys to continue to pray um, for the property and, and all that stuff. We're moving forward. I, I, I mentioned we've got an architect working on renderings. Uh, the surveyors have flagged it. And so we're just, we're just, we're just God's, we're just moving forward, man. So keep it lifted up in prayer. Um, we're in 5,000 square feet right now, and uh, we're drawing 15,000 square feet. So there'll be room for everybody. That's what we're praying for. So um, exciting times for Calvary Mar Maricopa. It's exciting times. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Go with God, church, all week. God bless you.